Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Modern Web Podcast. I am your host, Rob Osell. I'm a developer at This Dot Labs. Uh, my co-host for this podcast will be Jake Dome. Jake is a developer at Good Work. Jake, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Today, we're going to be talking about utility-first CSS and Tailwind as a library. And joining us today to talk about that are Adam Watton and Sarah Dion. So Adam is a full-stack developer, entrepreneur, and creator of Tailwind. Adam, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks so much for having me on. Listen to that awesome audio. <laughs> and uh, Sarah is a senior software engineer at Algolia. Sarah, how are you doing? I'm good. Nice to see you. Great. So to start us off, uh, because not everybody joining us will be on the same page, uh, this idea, this concept of utility-first CSS. Um, if you have like an elevator pitch for it, Adam, like how do you how do you describe it to people that maybe aren't familiar with it already? Uh, sure. So the basic idea is just write CSS the way that you've been taught for the last 20 years is the wrong way to write CSS. <laughs> um, so it's not that much different from inline styles conceptually. You know, you basically your HTML is where you build your user interface. You don't context switch. You just try and stay in the same place as much as possible. Use these tiny little CSS classes that just kind of target a single property, but sort of let you choose from a sort of curated sort of um, menu of CSS. <laughs> and you use that to build things up. And you don't worry about extracting more complex CSS selectors until you actually start noticing that you're dealing with sort of painful duplication and stuff like that. And it sounds, um, it sounds kind of like a horrible thing at first. And I think everyone's first reaction is, wow, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. But I've yet to meet someone who uh, has started with that opinion then actually tried to build something with it who didn't come away thinking uh, the exact opposite. Awesome. Sarah, did you have any other, like, do you have any, uh, anything to add to that or anything that you, um, that you add when you, when somebody asks you about utility for CSS? Yeah. So everything that Adam has said, I share every, every word that he said. And to me, uh, one of the, one of the things that I love about utility first is that, it's all about composition instead of inheritance, which is a principle that you try to follow in many languages, in actually in programming languages. Uh, this is also applicable to CSS. Instead of inheriting, you are composing, which is much better in terms of uh, predictability, avoiding side effects in your program. And this is also something that is shared in functional programming. You want to, to go with immutable data structures. You want to go for composability, for predictability, avoiding side effects. And that is everything that Utility First CSS is all about. So to me, this is really going in the direction of the direction of mature CSS. I think CSS has been through many architectures uh, for the last 20 years. And we are finally approaching something that is mature for big projects and something that can keep sane from zero to five or 10 years in a project. In a project because if you've been writing CSS, you know that it's usually pretty at the beginning and then it goes downhill. And this is the first methodology that I've been using uh, with websites for several months or even a year, and it does not go into something that you cannot maintain anymore and that you just want to wipe and start over. So uh, addressing maintainability, um, you say it's maintainable. When you're writing Tailwind styles, and one of the kind of main thrusts that really st stuck with me when learning it was um, not abstracting things prematurely so writing you know your classes right in your html and then as you notice patterns finding a good abstraction for that later um, and i think there's there's a great I, I don't remember who talks about this but there's something called the rule of three and it's once you've done it three times the same way or similar way you have enough context to know what things can be abstracted and what things are different in each use case so when, when, so you build out your HTML with these classes. Once you start to notice patterns, um, either with Tailwind or something else, um, you know, like tachyons or something like that, how would you make that abstraction? And what are the things that you need to kind of be aware of when you go to do that? 
Um, so I think there's sort of two general approaches, right? The first approach that I think is the more instinctive one for most people is to create their own custom CSS class to sort of groups together, maybe a common set of properties that they're setting at the same time. Like maybe you're working on a marketing site and you've got a bunch of headings that kind of have the same color and the same size and the same font. And you're kind of sick of writing those like four or five utility classes every single time. And you want to make sure that if you want to change one of them, that you can change all of them at the same time. Um, so one way that you might do that is by creating like a custom class, like a like a heading class, right? And in Tailwind, we would refer to this as sort of a component class because it's sort of composed of multiple sort of underlying utilities. And the way that you do that in Tailwind, we have some tooling to kind of make it a little bit easier. So you just kind of whip open your CSS file and go to kind of the component section and name the class whatever you want. So maybe it's like, you know, dot heading two or something. And then inside there, Tailwind has this um, special at apply CSS directive, which is sort of like a, a custom syntax and you can say add apply and then after that you can just list all the utility classes that you had in your html and tailwind will sort of mix those in to that class kind of like how a sas mix in works and then you can just go to your html and every place where you were sort of repeating those combinations you just kind of replace that with this new custom class um i think the the, the other thing that people should be thinking about when they're trying to extract things is asking like whether or not CSS is even the right place to create the abstraction. I think um, if it's just something that goes on a single tag, like a heading tag or a button or something like that, it often is reasonable to create like a custom class that just kind of composes these other CSS classes. Um, but for more complex things, a lot of the time, it's not just the styles that are being duplicated, it's the structure too, because you might be building like a little, a little card component that maybe has an image and then like a heading and then a description and maybe some subtext or something. And maybe there's seven HTML elements there that sort of need to be constructed in this specific order. And um, just creating some CSS classes like, um, you know, like real estate card or whatever, real estate card title, real estate card description, real estate card image, those don't tell the whole story about how this component actually has to be structured to actually be able to be reused. So a better approach for most things beyond just like simple buttons or like a form element or something is to actually extract like templates. So um, basically any ecosystem that you're working in, in is going to have support for this. I don't think many of us are building that many projects where we're just writing straight up vanilla HTML from scratch. Usually you're working with, you know, on one end of things, you might be working with ERB templates and Rails or something. At the complete opposite end of the spectrum, you might be building like a completely client-side Gatsby site or another React site or something. The thing that all these kind of things have in common is they already include some way to extract partials in some sense, right? So in an ERB Rails app, you might extract a partial for this real estate card that accepts some parameters that kind of fill in the blanks where where the what the image should be, what the title should be, what the description should be. And in React, you would just kind of create a component that kind of does the same thing, same thing in view. And the nice thing about doing things this way is that once you've kind of extracted all that HTML into a component, there's no pressure to extract the CSS anymore because even though you might have like seven or eight utilities on one of these elements, it's not actually a duplication issue anymore because it's all kind of localized in that one spot. There's already a source of truth for those styles that just happens to be in an HTML partial instead of in a CSS class. So those are sort of the two ways that you can sort of tackle um, abstracting out common patterns and stuff that you find in your project um, with Tailwind. And yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's really important to sort of work this way where you don't worry about duplication at first and you wait until you wait until that first time where you actually try to uh, edit something and realize, oh, I got to edit these four other things at the same time. It's like, okay, now you've proven that there's like a link. You know what I mean? You don't necessarily know that these things have anything in common until you actually want to update multiple of them at the same time. And I think the reason this is important is because if you don't do it this way, you can make the mistake of including styles in these abstractions that are actually context specific. So like a really common problem that I see in CSS code bases is people just doing things as simple as baking in like outer margins into a class. Like I've certainly worked on 
classes or projects in the past where someone's had a button class that has like a margin bottom baked into it. Just sort of assuming that anywhere I use a button, well, I'm gonna want a bottom margin on it. And it's not long before you hit a situation where um, you wanna change that for some reason, right? So I think by by sort of letting the extra abstractions reveal themselves and making sure you're only extracting the parts that you know for sure you'd always wanna change simultaneously, um, it can save you a lot of headaches down the road. That's really awesome advice. Um, Sarah, I had a question for you. I, um, you have a really good blog post in defense of utility for CSS. And um, actually, before I had fully read the entire article, I had started generating a couple of objections that I've heard for utility first, and I realized you'd cover almost all of them. But I had one recently that I don't know that it was covered, and I'm curious what you would say to it. I talked to somebody about utility for CSS, and they said, oh, I don't need that. Um, I have those kind of utility classes. They just come with Bootstrap. I don't, I don't have a problem with that, you know? And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Like, are is that the same thing, even though it's a similar type of approach? Or is Utility First CSS fundamentally more different than from something like Bootstrap, uh, you know, that, that, you know, there's an answer to somebody when they kind of say, oh, I don't need that. I've already got utility classes. So regarding Bootstrap, ultimately, this is more of a, object-oriented CSS framework where you have, indeed, you have a couple of utility classes. I, I don't know about Bootstrap 4 because I did not use it, but I remember from Bootstrap 3 that you had things, you had things like pull left or pull right to just float something on the left or on the right and a couple of other things like that. And it's not uncommon in those kinds of frameworks like Bootstrap to see those utility classes. And I would say that this is actually doing utility first in reverse. It starts with components, and then it ends up with a couple of utility classes. And at first, that was my approach. I was thinking, OK, I will create my components, and then I will have those little utilities when I need them, hide, show, uh, stuff like that, clear, fix. Uh, but at some point, you you hit a moment where you don't really know whether you should compose on an element or if you should use a component. And that becomes a bit weird in your head and your HTML starts being messy, your CSS starts being messy, and you don't really know whether you should make, you should make, comp uh, you should compose something or you, or if you should just create a component that embeds everything. So I think going the other way around um, allows you to think a lot less about it. What you will think about is all the utilities that you may need. Create also all the utilities that pertain to your design system. And nowadays, it's more and more common that in serious projects, you have a design system, a design system that goes with it. People care about having a consistent color scheme. People care about having a consistent, uh, consistent font sizes, line heights, and it's much less overhead to start from that and to compose on your HTML than to start with components and to sprinkle some utility classes. Because at some point, then when you want to enforce some rules in a team, it becomes really complicated to define when it's better to compose on an HTML element or when it's better to create a new abstraction. So in my thinking is that I'd rather compose as much as I can until the pain of re-adding the classes really manifests and then I know that I need to create a component. And to go back on what Adam was saying, I totally agree on the fact that most of the time, the abstraction does not belong to the CSS. It really belongs to a template or something like that. And to me, the moment when you want to create a component is when you want to reuse something in a different context. So for example, let's say you have a, nav uh, a navigation. It's like in a sidebar, and you have list items, and some of them are nested. So you may be tempted, if you have some repetition, to create a list item component. But actually, you, you should, you, you'd rather use something like a template that you repeat because this list item will never be used in another context, or at least you don't know yet. And 
it's much better to go back and to abstract those utility classes when you are sure that you need another sidebar with the exact same list items. But it's also all about the maturity of the design that you've been handed, your comprehension of that design, your comprehension of where it's going to go. So to me, the really great thing that you have with utility first is that you can always go back. You can, you can always undo. Undoing with components is, is much harder because then you have dependencies. You will have a card and you will have a variation of that card. And suddenly there is a change on the design that makes you want to change the base, the base element, the base component. And then you have this fragile base class problem that you may see in uh, object-oriented languages like PHP or Java. So to me, yes, I really understand the appeal of something like Bootstrap with OOCSS. And I think they make a lot of sense if you have a small project. My blog uses BEM. Uh, it doesn't really, I, I, I really want to redo it with utility first, but for now, it's perfect because it's only a blog that is not going anywhere in terms of style. It's not going to grow into something huge. But when you have a project that starts to be rich in terms of CSS, when you have something like a huge dashboard or you have a website with a lot of styles, then it makes a lot of sense to go with utility first because you're going to remove all the overhead and you're going to start with same bases. Awesome. That's that's great. That's super helpful. Um, one thing you mentioned is generating utility classes based on your design system. So your things like your font sizes, your colors, et cetera. Um, and that is a great segue into talking about my favorite CSS framework, um, Tailwind. So Adam, just kind of talking about that, um, how you how you would generate those classes. Maybe you could talk to us about what Tailwind is and uh, you know, like how you customize it to your project, you know, how you configure it and things like that. Yeah, sure. So um, Tailwind is kind of like, a, it's a framework, but it's also sort of like a, a utility framework generator at the same time. So um, the way that it works uh, from a technical standpoint is it's implemented as a post-CSS plugin, kind of like auto prefixer, for example. So you sort of feed your CSS into it. It kind of looks for different things in it that it might want to tweak, and then it spits out some new CSS at the end. And um, the way it works is in your CSS file, you drop these sort of markers um, that Tailwind recognizes, which look like at Tailwind utilities, at Tailwind components, at Tailwind base. And you can sort of think of these as like Tailwind specific import rules for these like three buckets or three sort of categories of styles. And then what Tailwind does is it looks for these kind of markers and then it replaces them with a bunch of generated CSS based on a configuration file that you provide it. So out of the box, Tailwind includes like a default sort of config file or a default design system, which specifies like a really comprehensive color palette, a spacing scale, a type scales, a bunch of box shadows, um, widths and heights and line heights and letter spacings. And basically, you know, every commonly used CSS property, we've sort of distilled down to a set of sort of fixed values to choose from that we think are like a pretty reasonable, fairly generic um, set. But for many projects, you know, just using the design system that Tailwind ships with uh, isn't enough. Like you might already have a color palette that you're using um, for your product that, you know, you can't just use Tailwind's defaults or uh, maybe you want to use custom fonts or you want to use a different type scale for one reason or another. So, um, to change that stuff, Tailwind gives you this tailwind.config.js file that just kind of lives in your project. And you can just sort of um, override whatever parts of Tailwind's design system you want. So if you want to override the color palette, you just add a colors key inside your config file, list all the colors that you want to use instead. And um, now Tailwind will use your colors instead of the colors it ships with. And you can configure like not only just the values, but the names as well. So out of the box, Tailwind uses like a very literal color naming scheme. So you might have classes like BG Blue 500, where the number is sort of a scale from 100 to 900 in steps of 100, where 100 is the lightest and 900 is the darkest, sort of inspired by material designs naming scheme. 
Um, but if you want to name your colors like primary, secondary, whatever, you can totally do that. And Tailwind will just take whatever kind of the keys are in the config file and make those sort of the last part of the utility class name and then assign the value from it. So you can configure everything, you know, the breakpoints, the colors, the padding, the spacing scale, the line heights, um, shadows, whatever, all that stuff is completely configurable. And um, yeah, that, that's that's basically it. So um, I know like, I'm actually something I would be curious about is Sarah on uh, the Algolia stuff that you're using Tailwind on, like how much of it is customized? Like what, what remains from like Tailwind's defaults and what is completely um, designed kind of like by your team? Does it feel like you've sort of created a completely new framework just to use on Algolia projects? Or is it, um, does it still kind of feel mostly like default tailwind with a little bit of stuff sprinkled on top so we kept the naming exactly as it was in the tailwind default so uh, the algolia website uses tailwind prior to version one so it's still the former class names so there might be a few changes with the new version of tailwind the v1 uh still I really liked the way the classes were named, and I saw that there, there was a lot of care and a lot of work that were, was put into it because they really feel totally natural when you use them. So this is exactly the same as it was in the original Tailwind when we, do we downloaded it in the project. Now, the things that we customized are the obvious, the colors, the fonts, the font sizes, the line heights, et cetera. Then everything that is like the truncate or the, the classes to, to make things absolute or relative, of course, that does not change. But what I really like is that with Tailwind, and for that matter, I would say probably any framework, but with Tailwind is that what you really want to customize is more the sizing. When I, when I say the sizing is like, what are the increments for your paddings, your margins, all those things. For for example, we use an eight-point grid, kind of a variation of the eight-point grid. So for each margin padding, we have one, two, four, eight, then 16, 24, uh, et cetera. So that we generated it on our end. Um, but then, yes, it's the font sizes, it's the line height and the colors. And then you can just get going. And that's really nice is that you can really start writing your final code after setting tailwind like after spending probably 15 20 minutes setting up tailwind which is really really cool that's awesome yeah i we use tailwind uh, at the company i work at and one thing that's super neat about it is that you kind of get the familiarity with classes and the way things work that you get with something like bootstrap without that you know bootstrap site style you know like you've you've gone to a website that's like a simple crud app or something like that and you're like ah bootstrap site right and there are ways to customize bootstrap and make it not that way but by default you'll see a lot of sites out there that you kind of know are bootstrap sites and um, the nice thing about that when you're using it is, you know, when you jump into a bootstrap for site from another bootstrap for site, you kind of know what components you have, what utilities you have and things like that. Um, well, you get that same, some of that same familiarity with tailwind because you jump into a, a different tailwind site and you know, you can do like flex justify center. Um, and you kind of know how the scales will work, even if you don't know their exact values. Um, and then even with that, you know, as, if you don't know the values, you know, you, you go to set a background color and you're like, oh, what project am I in? You can just jump into your Tailwind config file and everything is documented there in one place. So it's easy to reason about. It's easy to know what things are available to you, um, but without kind of that uh, unconfigured style that um, makes sites kind of look boilerplate. So the, when I jump into a site, the first thing I do is open up our, our Tailwind config and then look at the design system or whatever we're building off of, swap out all the colors, swap out all the fonts. Um, but I do try to stick to the Tailwind conventions that were chosen. And I know those were chosen very thoughtfully. I saw a ton of uh, 
GitHub issues and things like that. And everyone was arguing about pretty much everything. Should it be letting, you know, everything? Like there were a lot of, uh, I know you made some hard decisions and we generally are on board and we're happy to just, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if you've ever used Prettier and you've been, you've fought with your team about semicolons or no or whatever, it's just like, Having someone decide for you saves you a lot of headaches. So uh, we're pretty appreciative of the choices that have been made. So uh, just to yeah. piggyback up that though, Adam, uh, is um, there is this debate with utility, right? Whether to use the short abbreviated names or whether to use long full names. And I know some people that have looked at some of this utility first stuff is like, I can't read that. And if I go to another site that uses a different way of naming, they do it the same way, but they name things completely different. So as a library author, as a user of this, and maybe for both of you, you know, how do you navigate that, the short names versus long names, and also how you choose names as a library author to maybe be in sync with similar libraries or something like that? Yeah, sure. So this is definitely a problem that we spend a lot of energy on. Um, I think uh, the way that we kind of name things in Tailwind, there's, there, there's generally sort of two approaches that you can take to naming things, right? One is to sort of try to name things in like the least ambiguous possible way where like there's a system for all the names and um, you can guess every single class name based on, you know, like I've seen systems, for example, where it's like, okay, the class name is always the first letter of each word in the CSS property or something like that, which is a system. It kind of removes the need to sort of pick something that makes sense or picks, you know, pick something that feels right. Um, with Tailwind, we tried to sort of balance that with also trying to make things uh, expressive and also terse when possible. So there's, there's room for ambiguity in Tailwind in the sense that Background color classes, for example, and background position classes are both just prefixed with like BG dash. So BG dash green is a color because you know green is a color, and BG dash top is a position because there's no color named top. You know what I mean? But you could you could conceivably decide you want to call one of your colors top, and now you have like a kind of a situation to do it. Um, so in terms of like the like how terse to be versus how expressive to be, we try to kind of take it on a case by case basis. So things that you're using constantly like padding and margin, we thought, okay, let's keep these as short as humanly possible. So padding is just P, margin is just four, margin top is MT. Um, but for things that uh, are used less frequently or where there's like more room for ambiguity, then we decided to be a little bit more um, verbose. I'm trying to think of a good example of something that's like really verbose. I don't think there's anything that's really too bad. Um, you know, stuff like BG cover is kind of like a longer one, but it's clear what it kind of means, right? Whereas in another framework, maybe that's just like BGC or something. And I don't know what that means. I think the other thing is like, um, we tried to optimize the naming to work uh, for people who are familiar with other CSS frameworks too. So like, a lot of the time when we add something to Tailwind that we didn't have before, but maybe Bootstrap has in some way, shape, or form, I'm always looking at Bootstrap to see like, okay, what did they name it? Because um, a lot of people come to Tailwind from a framework like Bootstrap, and if they already have this muscle memory, then why not just use the same name? Because it literally doesn't matter what it's called at the end of the day. All that matters is that you can memorize it and you can learn it kind of like a language. Like we debated for a long time whether the border radius utilities should be like rounded dash or radius dash. And I went back and forth on it myself a million times until I ultimately decided, well, Bootstrap uses rounded. So we're gonna use rounded because who cares? Like literally both names are fine. You know what I mean? Um, one might be more perfect than another in some theoretical way, but it actually doesn't matter. Um, but I think the other thing you'll find is that as you get like more experienced using tools like Tailwind, I think you do start to want shorter names more often because eventually you just start almost reading the class names as like, you know, some different language, you know, <laughs> I almost think of it like keyboard shortcuts for your CSS, you know what I mean? It doesn't really matter what it says as long as you can read it and understand it. But I think the the difficulty is that going with like really terse names for everything from the start um, makes the onboarding so much more difficult. So I think that's why you see a lot of people have this reaction to a tool like Tachyons coming from whatever CSS system they're using before where they're like, what is this gibberish? I don't know what it means. When the reality is like the people who worked on that project 
maybe they started with like names that were less terse, but as they used it longer and longer, it's like, uh, I don't want to type this whole thing. I'm just going to shorten flex to DF for display flex or whatever. And yeah, that looks weird until you learn it. But um, once you learn it, it actually kind of feels like, like second nature. But I didn't want to suffer from that same problem of having people sort of have this objection to overcome in terms of like just not being understand the hieroglyphics that they were seeing in their html so we tried to strike a good balance between things being clear by just looking at them but also as terse as possible for the things that you use really 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 frequently and i'm pretty happy with the balance that we ended up with at the end of the day yeah as a as a tailwind user i'm really happy that you went for clear class names and Certainly things like padding and margin, which are much more helpers. It's okay to have something that is much more terse because it remains obvious when you see it and you see it uh, with the number then appended to it. You kind of understand what it does. It does not take too much of mental overhead to do it. But I really like the approach of going with what the utility is lo is doing and what it looks like rather than trying to stick too much to the original um, CSS that is embedded into it. For example, in Tailwind, you have truncate and truncate is a combination of three CSS rules. It's overflow hidden, it's text overflow ellipsis and white space no wrap. But when you see truncate, it's like, okay, I know exactly what it does. When you see flex, yes, sure, it's tied to a CSS behavior, but this is because you know when you do CSS that you have many ways of displaying an element, a block element. So it makes a lot more sense to stick to something that is closer to the original CSS rule set rather than abstracting away from it and saying, okay, this is what it looks like. But on, in my opinion, it's a lot easier to onboard new team members when you have a, a utility for CSS code base. It's a lot easier to onboard new people when you have clear names. If people see things like DF or TT, uh, uh, UPP for text transform uppercase or whatever, then it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to learn. And the problem is it's not like when you're learning shell, bash, ZSH, or when you're learning Vim and you're doing it progressively. Suddenly you open a page and you have all those utility classes that you see at once and you need to understand, understand them all at once and you need to read the entire uh, manifest file. And it's a lot to take in. So to me, it's perfectly fine that it's not abbreviated. I think abbreviations can also seem like a good idea at first, and then it's the same as uh, abstractions, then you might regret it later. And I feel like modern tools like autocomplete do a lot of work for you anyway. So to me, going for lengthy names, like you have to strike a balance, but lengthy names, there is zero downsides, even when it, when it comes to the file size at the end like compression is all about taking that like taking all those repetitions like this is all like gzip is all about handling repetition so you don't really care you're not going to shave any significant size because your class name has three characters instead of 10 characters it does not make sense anyway so i feel like there is a movement right now that is going towards in programming in general that is moving towards clearer code let's let's write code that is understandable for humans maybe sometimes you think of a very neat very terse way of writing a piece of code it's a one liner and it would be perfect but guess what the machine doesn't really care like if you're shaving i don't know a quarter of a millisecond does that really matter does that really matter for your css because at the end of the day, your machine, the machine does not really care, but your coworkers do, your future coworkers do, and the people who might be tempted to rewrite the code base because they don't understand anything about it, they also care. So I feel like writing code is first for humans, and 
any naming convention should go di di into that direction. One thing um, that I want to jump back to before we hop off the topic of kind of tailwind fundamentals is uh, I know you mentioned earlier it's not uh, dissimilar in ideology to inline styles. Um, one thing that I thought of when I started working with this is, and this is before Tailwind, Adam, I read your article about separation of concerns and uh, Tailwind wasn't released yet. So I was on a project, so I started throwing my own utility classes in there. And uh, one thing I ran into is dealing with um, states. So uh, variants, like hover states, focus states, uh, breakpoints. And that's one thing that inline styles can't do that utility classes can. So maybe Adam, you could speak to, because this is what a really cool kind of core feature of Tailwind is being able to generate these responsive utilities and then also responsive classes in your own CSS um, using the at responsive directive or at, uh, what is it now, at variance. So uh, in Tailwind 1.0. So if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So yeah, you you kind of, introduced it there pretty well but the general idea is that um all of the utilities that tailwind ships with can be sort of applied conditionally under different conditions so if um you want to like center some text but you only want to do it on like desktop screens and larger uh, you can use the text center utility which you know works by default everywhere but you can prefix it with like lg colon uh, which says like on large screens make this text center um, and if you want it to be text left on small screens, you can do SM colon text left, and that'll only apply the, that style when it's actually met that condition, like when it's in that breakpoint. Uh, similarly, with like hover and focus and stuff like that, if you want to change the background color of something on hover, you just take any of the existing background color utilities and you prefix it with hover. So you might have something be like BG red 500 by default and then hover BG red 400. So it gets a little bit lighter when you hover over it. I think this is um, something that takes people a second to have it click for them and get used to at first because people are sort of used to having like one class that does that sort of encapsulates what should happen under these different states. You know what I mean? And, and I see this as like a common stumbling block for people first learning Tailwind. Um, they want to like edit BG Red 500 to like automatically go to BG Red 400 on hover. So they just have to write the one class. But the philosophy in Tailwind is that sort of everything is done in your HTML and classes should only ever do one thing. So you should never have, you know, um, a background color class that changes under different conditions. You should actually just have versions of that same class that only apply conditionally and you compose those classes in your html to sort of get the effects that you want so tailwind supports like uh, hover styles focus styles out of the box that are enabled for um for all the places that you'd sort of expect to be able to do it so like background color border color text color um opacity box shadow and then if you ever need to um enable those features for sort of other categories of utilities that we don't have enabled out of the box you can do that in your config file so for whatever godforsaken reason you want to change the margin of something on hover uh, you can just enable the hover variants for margin in your config file we also include support for um, some other variants that are just disabled across the board by default just to save on file size because these things kind of blow up there's sort of a combinatorial explosion whenever you introduce variants of everything but you can enable like a disabled variant for example to only style things when they're disabled um we have like focus within support we have uh i think today i just merged visited support um there's another cool one called group hover which isn't really like built into css but um it's sort of like a cool tailwind abstraction so a really common thing that you need to do in css is change the style of an element when like the parent is hovered. So say you have a card and like the card background color changes when you hover it and you need to change the text color inside the card to match um, or, you know, to be visible. Um, so with Tailwind, what you can do is you can drop like, a group class on whatever kind of the containing element should be. And then on the elements inside of it, you can say like group hover text white. So whenever the nearest group is hovered, those styles will be applied. So that's kind of a cool way to do one of those things that you might at first think, well, I probably still need to write custom CSS to do this sort of thing. 
Um, yeah, and you can combine all those with the responsive stuff too. So you could say if I want the background color to change on hover on large screens, so you can say LG colon hover colon BG green. Um, yeah, so that kind of is how we we sort of handle those things. And that's definitely sort of the killer feature of utilities versus inline styles, I think, because I mean, I, I wish we had support for that stuff in inline styles still, because there's certainly situations with Tailwind where you sort of need inline styles as a bit of an escape hatch. Like maybe you're working on a marketing site that has some image in the background that's positioned like very specifically. It's like 331 pixels from the top and like 17 pixels from the right or whatever. And those values aren't really like design system values. You know what I mean? They don't really make sense to bake into like your API of Tailwind classes, uh, but you need them for this one specific situation. So what you end up doing or what I end up doing is just writing inline styles for that. And I don't feel guilty about that at all because it's still just doubling down on the same general philosophy of like, I'm styling the HTML directly. Um, but it'd be nice if I could do media query stuff there too, because once, because that's a perfect situation where it's like, okay, on mobile screens, it's 331, but on, you know, tablet screens, it moves over to this side and has these other bizarre random values. Um, so it'd be sweet if we could sort of have a good escape hatch for that. But kind of what I do to avoid that currently is either write Harry custom CSS or what I do more often is actually just kind of duplicate that markup and bake in the inline styles, exactly what I need for each breakpoint, and then just conditionally show the duplicates. So maybe on mobile, I show this copy of the image, and then on tablet, I hide the mobile one and show this other one that has the inline styles baked in. And as long as you make sure to, you know, throw your uh, ARIA attributes and stuff on there, so people using screen readers aren't seeing 100 versions of the image or whatever, it ends up being totally fine. And the additional markup is usually not super significant unless you're inlining like a 30 kilobyte SVG five times or something. But yeah, usually that ends up working pretty well. One thing about the uh, the Tailwind responsive variants is that they, they do work um, mobile first. So your your main background um, background red would apply at, it would apply to every size. Um, but then if you had like the large, it won't apply large down, it will apply like large size up. Um, so I'd love to hear from both of you guys if you actually develop your sites mobile first or if you start a desktop and work down. Because I know that was kind of a big debate in web dev a couple years ago. And uh, it doesn't it doesn't get talked about a lot anymore, but I'm not quite sure where people landed on that. So I think it really depends on the project that you're building. Sometimes it makes a lot of sense to go mobile first because you want to make sure that the mobile version is not something that you rush at the end and make sure that everything is kind of responsive. So I feel that it still is a good advice when you want to create something that is really uh, polymorphic, that it that can really that is intended to be read on either a mobile or a desktop. But then I would not make it a hard rule. Uh, Let's take the Algolia documentation, for example, which is the website that I maintain at Algolia. It's a documentation website. And a documentation website from our research and our analytics is usually mostly massively viewed on desktop. So it would not make sense to make it mobile first, to think of it for the mobile first and then progressively add, add stuff or rearrange it for the desktop. And it would not make sense because not many people, if any, any people at all, are actually watching it or spending time on it on their mobile. It happens, of course, but most of the time, people who actually use the documentation and not just peek at it on their phone, most people who use the documentation are actually building at the same time. So they're using the website in their browser or they have dual screen and they have documentation on, on the one end and they have their implementation on the other end. So it would absolutely not make sense to think of the mobile version first. Of course, it's really important to make a responsive version, but to me it's, and it, it works for everything in general. Think of your use case, your specific use case, not about a hard rule that someone on the internet 
uh, like someone on the internet talked about, someone said, you should go utility first, you should go mobile first, you should, no, go with what makes sense with your project. Give it a little bit of thought. Every methodology has its perks and its disadvantages. So instead of just blindly following what people say, actually try to read everything that they say, read why, or if they don't tell why, they just say, this is the way. Try to find material where people explain why and try to think of it and not go blindly with a hard rule. I think uh, what Sarah said made a lot of sense. I think that's the way to do it. You have to think about your use case and, and kind of design what you're working on to uh, be optimized for the situation that people are using it in uh, most often. I can speak to sort of it from a technical perspective in terms of maybe just how I generally work with Tailwind itself. Because the default breakpoints at least are designed to sort of be mobile first, I find the workflow is a bit smoother if you implement the mobile version first, because then as you sort of just like increase the viewport size, you can layer on these responsive utilities to tweak it, where if you start with the desktop size of Tailwind, a lot of time you can find yourself, okay, I want to change this on mobile. And to change it on mobile, I actually have to like add a prefix to what I had originally as the desktop class, then add a new mobile class. It's, it's just like not quite as, as smooth of a, a workflow, but I do still build a lot of stuff that way. And I think a lot of us do, because like when you're building a website, you're, you're building it on a computer where the screen is big, right? Um, but uh, yeah, um, I like to do the mobile. I try to force myself to do the mobile first thing a little bit more often lately, just because I find um, I find I'm changing less HTML structure usually if I start mobile first than if I start desktop first. Like a good example is you have um, you have some stuff that maybe like appears like in a grid or something on desktop, but you want to do you want to group parts of those grid in different ways on mobile to sort of show it in like two columns or something. Um, if you build a mobile version first, you'll realize, well, I need to actually add a wrapper around these two columns and these two columns because I need to manipulate them together. Um, but if you build the desktop version first, a lot of time you'll build just the four columns separately and then you got to put it on mobile. And it's like, oh, wait, I actually need to target both these columns at the same time. Now I have to add that wrapper. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think I think it totally works both ways. I think because of the way that Tailwind is designed out of the box, it's a, a little bit smoother of an experience to start on mobile. I still don't do it most of the time. And you can actually configure the breakpoints too. So if you're building a website where um, you kind of want to build it, you kind of want to optimize for the desktop experience, but you sort of want to like tweak it as the screen gets smaller, you can change the breakpoints in Tailwind to not be min width breakpoints and to make them max width breakpoints instead. And um, that way you can kind of work top down and still have that same smooth workflow while still sort of focusing on the desktop experience first. And I know a couple of people have done stuff like that. Other people will configure the breakpoints to be min width and max width breakpoints so that like by default, Tailwind's breakpoints sort of cascade up. So if I set something on a small screen, well, that'll apply on small, medium, large, and extra large. A lot of people want it to only work on small. So they'll add a max width there. So everything is sort of stuck in these fixed buckets, right? So um, yeah, it's super flexible in that sense. So it can just kind of adapt to whatever way makes sense to work for, for your project. Although most people stick with the defaults because that way you have a little bit more shared knowledge from project to project if you're not totally ripping things apart. Great. So uh, hopefully people are fascinated that weren't already fascinated with Utility First or Tailwind and they want to put it on their site. But you know they might have a complete spaghetti site right now, or they might be using Bootstrap, or they might be using a different methodology. Um, so Sarah, I know you guys kind of just did something like this, integrating Tailwind in a site that already existed, I think, with your documentation site. I'm kind of curious if you had any lessons learned that you could share with people uh, about maybe adopting utility first stuff uh, when they might be using some other approach and maybe some of the pitfalls that you guys ran into. So I would say everything depends on the state of your current CSS. But to me, the healthiest way when it comes to CSS to integrate a new methodology is basically nuke everything and start over. Because the very nature of CSS is that it's global and the styles can leak really easily. So if you start to remove a bunch of things and reintegrate utility first, chances are that when you keep on removing stuff, 
you will have some side effects that you did not envision at the beginning. So another thing that may happen is that you do it progressively and you start, but suddenly it has to stop for some business reason and you don't come back to it or you come back to it only after a couple of months. And then the code base has grown immensely and you don't know what is what. So I would really recommend if you are thinking of integrating utility first, first thing would be plan it wisely. Uh, make sure that you have some time to do it. Make sure that it makes sense. Like imagine if you have a redesign that is coming up, wait for the redesign. It makes a lot of sense. You're going to change the full aspect of your website. So this is the perfect moment to change methodology. While if you do it right now and then in a couple of months you're going to redesign, then you will have to do the work twice. So I would say try to find the right moment to do it and then start from zero. Remove every bit of CSS that you have. Remove all the classes, all the inline styles if you have them. Remove everything. Rediscover what your website looks like without CSS. Rediscover the, the way it looks. Make sure that actually your HTML is, is proper. Make sure that your structure makes sense. Spend some time on your HTML. Make sure that it's sane. Make sure that it displays properly. You probably did some div nesting or some some weird stuff where, with your HTML to make it fit some stylistic choice. Maybe this is the right moment to clean that up because now you're going to go with something fully different. So yes, that would be my approach. Um, I would say also try not to do it all alone, but the first thing that you need to do, especially if you use something like Tailwind, is spend some time on the configuration file. This is this is your source, your source of truth. This is where things should, should stay neat, and this is where you want to make sure that you have everything. Of course, it will evolve. You will, have, you will add your own utility classes. In the Algolia website, we have many custom utility classes for things like gradients, but try to, try to give it some thought before you dive into building things. And because this is the whole purpose of utility first, like we talked about it a little bit earlier, how people usually think this is the same as inline styles. It is not. When you add a utility, it's, it becomes part of the system. Like the, the way that I like to describe utility first is that it exposes a well-defined API that you can use to, to compose more complex components. You're creating an API. Think of it, if you are a back-end developer, think of it as if you were building an, an, an API with endpoints. Every time you add an endpoint, it has to make sense. You don't just create an endpoint because someone needs some very specific thing. They use a tool set. And so spend some time on it. And then when you really know your HTML, when you've you've taken a step back away from your old website and all the constraints and you've cleaned it, you've cleaned it up, then it's the good moment, it's the right moment to start redesigning with utility first. Awesome. No, that's a really great point. And uh, this conversation has been awesome. It's been so awesome that the time has just flown by. Uh, so we're getting here to the end. So I thought we would do closing thoughts. So feel free if there's any last thoughts about Utility First CSS that you want to pitch, or if there's anything that you want to point people to as far as um, you know work that you guys are doing about this or related topics, uh, feel free. You know, One thing that I'll say about Utility First CSS that I have found really interesting is um, when I first pitched it to a team that I was working on, it was the designers who spoke up. And the designers said that they didn't like this approach. They thought that it would be either constraining or imposing. And I think what ultimately won them over, what I talked to them, as I said, no, think about all the time developers running over to your desk to ask whether that's font size 13 or font size 14. I said, now we'll agree on this sort of general principles. Then when you hand someone a design, instead of it having to be pixel perfect, completely specced from top to bottom, they'll just pick the utilities that'll most closely match. And if it's if it's slightly off from what the what you gave them in the sketch file, oh well, that was the closest they could get with the utilities. And as soon as I told them that, the designers were like, "Can we do it today?" You know. So I just I think that it's you know people 
think that this is just for developers, but realistically, I think designers on your team will love this approach too. And I would suggest pitching it and say, how often are we coming to you to ask about pixel perfect designs, you know, and can we fix that? So uh, how about uh, Jake, did you have any closing thoughts? Uh, no, I've been just drinking it in. I've learned a lot today and I have like 50 more questions I want to ask. So we may have to run this back another time, but uh, no, I was just happy to, happy to be here and enjoy learning. Great, how about you, Adam? Uh, yeah, I, I would say um, if you're interested in kind of learning more about Samhain and, and playing with it a bit, um, I worked really, really hard to make the documentation really kind of thorough. And um, so that's definitely a good place to check out, just at TailwindCSS.com. It, it goes a lot deeper than just sort of your usual API documentation for a library. And a, there's a lot of, you know, best practices stuff in there, sort of guides and tutorials on how to do sort of common things. Um, I try to basically write the documentation I wish I had for, for other CSS frameworks that I'd worked with in the past. So check that out. And if you're more of a visual learner right now, I'm actually working on like a really big Tailwind video series that'll just be totally free on the website too. Um, so that'll cover just, you know, getting everything set up and learning about the workflow and sort of dispelling any uh, sort of fears or objections. And then also kind of showing you how to use the framework effectively to create sort of common components and layouts. So uh, maybe you're not like a super CSS pro and you know, the, one of the challenges with working with Tailwind for a lot of people is you have to be good at CSS to use it. Like you have to know how Flexbox works and stuff like that if you wanna be able to get things in the positions that you want. Um, so what I'm working on right now will hopefully help people who, who don't feel super strong with CSS be able to learn like how do I accomplish these common patterns with Tailwind and sort of learn Flexbox just by accident and stuff like that. So um, you can check that out. That's at tailwindcss.com slash course. And I've been working hard on that and sending out emails now and then with uh, kind of some of the content as I've been creating it. And hopefully I'll have all those videos posted online probably early next month. Um, a little bit behind on schedule, of course, as a programmer tend to underestimate how much work things will be. Um, yeah, but check that out if you, if you kind of want to learn visually. It uh, should be a really cool project when it's done. Awesome. And Sarah, why don't you close us out with any thoughts you have? Yeah, so if you're interested in really dwelling about those front-end topics, CSS, JavaScript, but even programming in general, I, I really like to spend the time to write kind of lengthy, but always research articles. Uh, you can find them on my blog, frontstuff.io. This is where you will find the article that I wrote about uh, in defense of utility first. And yeah, this is the kind of articles that I like to write is, okay, let's sit down, let's, shy, let, let's move away from the Twitter rants and all that stuff. Let's think for a moment and let's weigh the pros and cons. And Regarding utility first, my, my final thoughts would be, especially for people who are still on the fence, I would say that remember that software development changes every day. We are in an industry that is still really young. And of course, we've learned a lot of things. Things are totally different from 20 years ago. But not because something is tried and true means that it's set in stone. And I would say try to avoid following what others have said as, is, as if it was gospel. Try to think about what you're doing, why you're doing it. And the final thing would be always try to do what's best for the industry, for the projects, and for the users. That is what matters. Perfect. What a great conclusion. And uh, that's it for today, everybody. Thank you for listening to this Modern Web Podcast on Utility First CSS. Thank you to our guests, Adam and Sarah. As always, the conversation doesn't have to stop here. You can find Adam online on Twitter at Adam Wathans. That's A-D-A-M-W-A-T-H-A-N. Sarah is on Twitter at FrontStuff underscore I-O. You can find my co-host Jake on Twitter at Jake Dome. So that's J-A-K-E-D-O-H-N. And you can find me online at Robocell, so R-O-B-O-C-E-L-L. -L. We hope to see you guys at the next one. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.